let's talk about the cross. It's a pretty heavy duty subject, as I, as I mentioned. And I'm going to just lay it on the line so we don't have time to, to, to mince around. Is that in the academy, where theologians talk about stuff, the number one issue that theologians are talking about is what are we going to do about the cross? What are we going to do about understanding its meaning for our world today? And so when you go to the, the academic meetings, that's like my other life, the guild it's called, there are panel discussions and books. And I'm a person who thinks that uh, the scholar shouldn't decide things about uh, faith and then sort of bring it to the people. That would be you. But that at least the arrows have to go both directions. So I love to be out in the church and teaching in the church, but also learning from churches what people are thinking so that I can bring that into the discussions in the guild. I see that as a particular vocation I have to be a kind of liaison person. Does that make sense? So I'll tell you what they're saying, and you can respond, and if you don't have any response, I'll just, I can keep talking. I can fill air time. No problem at all. Uh, and, and if all else fails, we have a long handout. We'll see if we prefer to, but it gives you something to take home. Um, but this is the big question. You ready? This, this might be shocking to some and not to others. The question is this. It's, does it make sense to say that the father needed the son to die in order to be able to forgive us? I told you it was kind of a big question, right? Huh. How many people have had that question before who want to admit it? You don't have to raise your hand. You've had that question. How many people have heard somebody talk about that question before? I heard there's a pretty good history, long history, of that question being considered. A little bird told me. His first name has three letters. Yeah. Uh, that's great. A lot of churches, it's sort of a, a closet question. And then when you bring it out, people go, oh, yeah, I wondered that, but I didn't know I could ask that question. We have a certain formula in mind often when we talk about salvation. And the formula is that God was completely righteous, and we sinned, and because God is righteous, God turned away from our sin, because our sin was a compromise of God's righteousness. And then Jesus came to build a bridge between us and God to heal that rift. Is that, does that sound fairly accurate? So what happened is Jesus went to the cross, died on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sin. The penalty it was necessary to be paid in order to, one theologian said in the 12th century, satisfy God's honor. That was a theologian named Anselm of Canterbury. He said God's honor, God's righteousness, needed to be satisfied due to our sinfulness. And the point of the incarnation is that Jesus came in order to pay the price, satisfy God's honor or righteousness, heal the situation so that we could be in relationship to God. Now various versions of what Anselm wrote way back in the 12th and 13th centuries have trickled down to us today so that when my students, I teach in Austin, when they go to the University of Texas campus and they, they do school projects where they interview people and they say, who is Jesus Christ? People will generally say, well, Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, it's Texas. It's kind of like Alabama. You get a lot of answers like that. I'm from New York. People in New York don't say that. They just spit at you and walk away. Not all of them like the question itself. Um, but at, at, the, at UT, uh, most students will say, well, Jesus Christ is the Christian Savior, or Jesus Christ is, is the Lord or God. But you get a little variation. But the second question, if my students ask, how does Jesus save us? 100% of the time, people will say, by dying on the cross for our sins. That's the number one thing people will say. In exactly that way. It's almost like a formula. Not, not, not saying that there's not value to that formula. I think there is. But it's interesting that there's a formula. Because Jesus did a lot of things besides dying on the cross. That's central. That's, we can't dispose of that. That's absolutely central. But Jesus taught... Right? He ate with tax collectors and sinners. He walked on water. He rose from the dead. Sometimes people will sneak in a little resurrection, but it's always with the cross. He died for our sins and then rose again. Right? So we've, we've gotten to the point where we've almost made this idea of how it is that God has saved us in Jesus Christ into a kind of formula. Right? Well, how does it work? How are we saved? Well, you have to believe in this rift that Jesus came and died, 
that that cross somehow fills in the gap, and now we can be reconciled with God. So this is the, the, the big guilt discussion, but a question many of us have had is, well, you know, how does, how does Jesus' death really help the situation? How does it really help? There was another theologian 50 years after Anselm of Canterbury named Peter Abelard, if you ever saw the movie Abelard and Eloise, it's the same Abelard, who way back then said, after he read Anselm's discussion of how it is that Jesus saves us by dying on the cross, he said, you know what, I don't even recognize this God Anselm's talking about. The God that I know doesn't need his son to die in order to be able to forgive us. God is God. God makes the rules. God isn't subject to any kind of system where it you know, that requires God to have a price be paid in order to compensate for God's honor or God's righteousness. Are you with me? Um, and if and you know the problem with Anselm, Abelard said, the critic said, is that he's almost setting up this system as being God, and God has to listen to some system. My God, Abelard says, gets to, gets to make the rules. My God makes the rules. And one of Abelard's favorite, favorite parts of scripture was Luke chapter 15, which is the so-called parable of the prodigal son. And Abelard liked to talk about that. And he said, uh, have you read that parable, Anselm? Anselm was dead. He yelled at him, you know, and have you know, Anselm, you have lots of time up there. You can still correct this. Have you read that parable? Well, I mean, look at that parable. Now this is Cindy's, Cindy, I'm, I'm adding some things to Abelard to make it even better. <laughs> I think, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, here's the improvement, is you have this, we all know the story. You have the son, takes half the inheritance, goes out and squanders it, right? Winds up, there's a famine in the land, and he's eating the husks of corn that would otherwise be fed to the pigs. Meanwhile, the father's son with the elder son, who's doing everything right, doing everything his father tells him. Right? And the younger son, he comes to a sort of an awareness, the text says. He comes to himself. We're not sure quite what that means, but comes to himself and he says, you know what? The hired hands at home eat better than I'm eating. I know what I'll do. Eureka, I've got it. I'll go home and I'll say to my father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. Okay, so we don't know whether he's truly repentant or he's just got a good strategy. <laughs> I mean, we just, we don't know. I mean, he's a pretty skinny guy. Could be just a strategy. But what we do know is this. Before he is 10 yards, 100 yards, 200 yards from that house, the father runs out to meet him. That father has been looking out the kitchen window. You, know, you ever do that for a kid or a person, metaphorically or literally? Waiting, waiting, waiting to see that beloved head come back, that beloved head on the horizon, the head that when you had that child in the baby Bjorn, you kiss, you know, the head that you bless with your hand of blessing, that head of that beloved one coming back the minute the father saw that son, he went running. I tell you what, that father has some real boundary issues. <laughs> he needs to go to get there because those kids are walking all over it. Right? That's our God. Running out. Running out in love. Excessive. Prodigal. That's what prodigal means. Turns out God's the prodigal. It means excessive. God's the prodigal. God runs out. The father runs out. Calls for a party. Gives him something to wear. Puts a ring on his finger. Right? So I'm talking about Abelard. Abelard says, look at that. Where's the cross there? Huh? 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 And some huh? Where's the cross in that? Oh, uh, well. Where's the cross? In that story, where is it? I don't know if it's anywhere. It could be in the in the fact of the father's excess. Did, you know, if, 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 if we say that what the father did is he he held nothing back, nothing back. I mean, he didn't. I mean, you know what that, that father? If he were being a better sort of father, he would have sat in the kitchen and <clears throat> covered up his love a little bit more. You know. <clears throat> for the sake of uh, a teaching moment with his son. And then, you know, his son would have come to the door, knock, 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 goes and opens the door. What, what do you have to say for yourself? You know, and the father would have waited if he had any sense for a confession. Then we could say, there's the cross. It's in the repentance. 
It's in some kind of sacrifice. There's something uh, in the story, right? There's something. And then the father might have, might have let him talk for a while and said, well, sit down and I'll make you a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> and he would have been being pretty darn gracious given what his son did to him. This excess, this running over, that's the excess of the cross. That's the excess of God's love. Holds nothing back. God in Christ didn't just dip his big toe into creaturely existence, human existence, but entered all the way in, into the womb of a woman. Not a popular place for God to go, right? Women couldn't even go into the temple when they were menstruating. Where in the world? Did the people of God ever get this idea that God entered into that place? Talk about redemptive. God entered in there. Mary, Carry, God, born of the Virgin Mary. Actually, it's not as much about whether Mary had sex or not. There's a bigger miracle here. That God, without whom nothing was made that was made, entered into a place that God was not supposed to be, not supposed to go, held nothing back in Bethlehem. Nothing back at Easter, all the way to that cross, into death, and just for good measure, we Presbyterians have in our creed descended into hell. Just to cover all the bases. <laughs> the same thing. Hell, nothing back. God goes even into where God is not. Do I understand that? No. Do I know what it's about? I think so. Nothing is untouched. Nothing is beyond redemption. God's love is so excessive, we cannot begin to fathom it. Scripture says it's deeper and wider than anything we can ask or imagine, right? right? That's how great it is. So Abelard said, stuff like that. And he said, I don't think, I don't think that this whole idea that what the cross is, is paying a price for our sin, is the way to go in understanding the cross. I like Abelard on this, you can tell. I right? worked out about this excess. But I think we have to do a better job of reclaiming the prodigalness of our prodigal God, the prodigal love. God holds nothing back. <clears throat> of course, it really bugs the elder son. Great parable. The elder son. I've always done everything you told me to, and yet you've never given me a party for my friends. And the elder son, it turns out, is right. Totally correct. The father's operating on a different order, the order of grace versus the order of law. Um, maybe Anselm, maybe this exchange, this transaction, right? This gap, Jesus fills the gap, the cross pays the penalty that fills the gap. Maybe that's a little bit too, one of the issues is it's, it's too much like a transaction and not enough like grace. All right, let me just pause because I see a couple, I'm imagining a couple concerned looks, um, but a couple happy looks and can't read your minds. <laughs> but I'm really interested in knowing what, what you think or how you want to use a last minute chip. Uh, maybe the elder son didn't need a party. Maybe the elder son didn't need a party. He didn't. I mean, he thought he did, but he didn't. You know what's great about, uh, maybe, maybe he didn't. What's uh, great for the elder son is that the father, who is so excessive, he's so caught up in the younger son coming home, um, he goes to the party, the father does, and I imagine it was a joyful party. And he looks around and he says, someone is missing. My elder son isn't here. And he goes out again to get him. He goes to get him. He doesn't forget his elder son. He goes in. So maybe, maybe you're right, he didn't need his own party. The father thought, the father thought he was missing out on something because he didn't come into the party for his brother. He didn't leave him behind. Yeah, isn't that interesting, that choice of words? He wasn't left behind. Get it? The message of the gospel isn't that it, the people will be left behind. For Pete's sake, that's the message of the world. It, that's the message of the world. The message of the gospel is you are not left behind. Even when it seems that way. You're not left behind. There's no place that God hasn't touched. Nowhere that Jesus hasn't gone. You are precious, you're beloved. Even when circumstances seem to argue for the contrary, we bear witness. We, Christian believers, are called to bear witness to the fact that, no, it is not true what the world tells you. You're not look behind. This is a powerful message. It's an absurd message. 
right? I mean, it's no accident. Scripture talks about being foolish for the sake of the gospel, sounding foolish. It's an absurd message. How can no one be left behind? But that's our hope, see, in Christ, who doesn't leave people behind. And uh, and also in the uh, in Luke chapter 15, that father, God the Father going in to get that elder son. I love that. And it's not that he's preferring the, the younger son. He's going after the elder son, too. He doesn't, he doesn't run out of love, this father. He just he keeps, you know, he keeps pouring out. Like I said, boundary issues is how we would label it. But. <laughs> Any other uh, points people want to make? I can keep going on some of this. I think the problem yeah. is the brothers having the party all the time and didn't recognize it. The older the older the brothers probably brother having a party all the time. Yeah, he was at the yep. party. He had everything he lost. That yeah, that's he what. Just in New York, he came home and said, "Where to go next?" I've <laughs> seen that before, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's exactly what the father says to the other son. He says, my son, I am always with you, and you are always with me. Don't you realize that everything I have is yours? So come into the party. So um, that's one of my favorite lines of scripture. I mean, so this is what it looks like to live in the grace, in that excess is what if we, this is a rhetorical question now, what if we were able to walk around in the world knowing that everything God has is ours? <laughs> yeah, I think I glimpsed it in moments, but all right, so, so note the reversal now here of grace and uh, a kind of transactionalism. I can use that word of exchange. God does this, we do this, we don't do this, we don't get that from God, we'll be left behind, right? Versus grace is 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 in a in a kind of transactional model. Here's the message. Everything you have is God's. And we soberly go, oh yeah, that's right, I know. That's why I come to church. I gotta be reminded. Everything you have is God's. Everything. So you know what you should do? Check up your stewardship a little. Kick it up. Sorry, I won't look at anyone. <laughs> 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 so, as the new pastor, as pastor, the new pastor, I'll say amen to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just think about these things because I don't have to do the fundraisers really. But I mean, what if what if we reverse it and our mentality was like, everything. God has his hours. Then you, when you're giving, you're not actually uh, giving away from yourself. You're giving to the household in which you're a part. <laughs> and so then, then whoever brought this up, I think this really, that was a really good response to your answer. The party for the brother, hey, you need to be careful with this. The party for the brother is also his party. It's a party of the household. He's already included. Um, he, just, he just doesn't know it yet. But not knowing it is a big problem. Do you, you know, this is what we believe. I'll tell you what Presbyterians believe about this. We believe right, that God has claimed us, right, whether or not we feel it, whether or not we know it, and that it really matters whether we know it or not. Here's a quote from Karl Barth. Um, so he was a reformed theologian. I'm required in my contract to quote him every hour that I read. <laughs> <laughs> and he says this, he says, reality, reality, the reality that we haven't been left behind can only become truth for us. Direct quote. Reality can only become truth for us. Dash, however supreme its ontological dignity. You all can understand yes. that, right? Yeah. However supreme, yes. however great it is, however hot stuff it is, that's my translation. I'm sure it's in the original German, right? However however magnificent it is, right? Reality, no matter how great it is, can only become true for us. It can only change us, Bart says, when we know it. When we know it. So this is what, what Calvin, I'm doing a little reformed uh, history lesson here, is Calvin. Calvin thought that's our work is mainly about helping people in church and outside of church gain a perception of the majesty of God, of who God is, and God's radical claim on us, radical at the root, all the way in, prodigal claim on us. When people know that, when we know that, the rest is just details. I mean, honestly, honestly, it hardly ever works this way, but it does sometimes, actually. 
honestly, when we know everything God has, have, 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 has is ours, the money sort of seamlessly like spills over into the offering plates and service flows. So, so I mean, in all seriousness, I'll, I'll get off the offering thing because we're touchy about money, but let's just think more abstractly about service in general, okay? Is it, is it you know, uh, when, when we uh, know that everything God has, ha has is ours and we're serving out of that, then we hardly even realize that we're, uh, that we're serving because our service is so consistent with our being. Our acts are so consistent with our being. So we become like the sheep in Matthew 25. Remember the sheep? Huh? When did we do that? Uh, my, my husband's from the country, and he's talking that sheep are dumb. I'm a city girl. I'm from Long Island. You know, what do I know about sheep? Um, but, 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 you know, the sheep in Matthew 25, remember? Remember, come on in. Huh? When did we visit the hungry? When did we clothe the naked? When did we... I mean, when did we feed the hungry clothing? And this is the sick one when, when we were in, and in prison. And uh, the gatekeeper says, um, you did it when you did it to the least of my brethren. And the sheep go, but we don't even remember doing it. <laughs> They've done it so seamlessly, so seamlessly in love. So now that, that's interesting when it comes to cross. That starts to look uh, like a model of faith, a model of salvation even, even a model for understanding Jesus. See, what if we understood Jesus less as, I probably did this last time I was here, but you don't remember from 10 years ago. So <laughs> kind of old shit. But uh, less as the father saying, son, get down there and rescue those people, right? Okay, dad, let me just put on my baby costume. I'll head right in, right? <laughs> Jesus says the 33 years, dies on the cross, whooshes back up to the father and says, all right, got that done, what's next, right? It's less Jesus sort of check, got that done, and more, um, and more Jesus loving us so much that this is what it took to be with us. I mean, you see Jesus going, huh, I have to die on the cross now? And as soon as he realizes, yep, I got to do that to be with these people. I can almost hear just to be on the edge of maybe what's appropriate, okay, if you allow that, allow that. I can almost imagine Jesus saying, all right, look, I'm going to go the whole way in. Just kill me. If you need to kill me, kill me, and I'll show you. I'll love you anyway. Right? You done your you gave it your best shot. You crucified me on the cross, and here I am. I'm back, and I'm not going anywhere. Right? I still love you. There he is on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He returns back to Peter and says, to Peter, this takes me out. I think this is grace and judgment come together perfectly. When Jesus looks at Peter and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus holds nothing back. He just keeps coming after us. He keeps coming after us. So that we'll know. So that we're not, we'll know. So that what the cross is about, again, then is not Jesus uh, fixing something. It's about Jesus holding them. But that's the way I think we should go in thinking about the cross. But we've got to work, we've got to work on it. We've got to work on it. But this idea of the formula, right? Sin separated from God, Jesus is a bridge. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I'm just going to just say it. I don't think it's working that well. Um, even for us, never mind in the kind of marketing to the world. Now, we've got great, there's a ton of stuff if y'all want me to send some more resources on, on this subject. Uh, you've got a lot in your heritage here. We've got a lot in our reform tradition. I mentioned Calvin and Bart. They'll let me keep my job. I'm just joking about the contract. I just tend to quote them a lot. But Calvin, back in the 16th century, he was very careful to say that Jesus saves us, Jesus saves us in a lot of different ways. It's not only by dying on the cross to pay a price, it's also by way of his teaching. Because by way of his teaching, he shows us that the Father God is not at a distance from us. I mean, as soon as you say Father, for all the other political uh, uh, sort of uh, debates around using that term, you know, should we, you know what I mean, should we call God Mother, should we use other terminology? Um, we shouldn't forget that, that Father is already, again, a radical idea. Call God Father. Father, you know, you fathers are actually, contrary to the stereotype, near to your children. You love your children. You nurture your children. To say father actually might be the best argument for saying mother, not an argument against it. It's only an argument against it if you think of fathers and mothers as opposites. So I just stepped on a little soapbox there. 
<laughs> to see it buys into a kind of like uh, uh, oppositional model between uh, mothers and fathers that I don't think is accurate biblically and make a biblical case. I'll tell you where I make it. Uh, Adam and Eve, when Eve is finally, when God finally gets it right after all the animals parade in and brings Eve to Adam, made out of his side. Uh, Adam looks at Eve and he doesn't say, you know, I'm from Mars, you're from Venus, we need some Deborah Tannen books in order to understand each other. <laughs> he looks at her and he says, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You are the near, you as different as you are from me, are nearer to me than any other one. See, that's God's creative intention and redemptive intention. No male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. Remember that in Paul? Yeah, I mean, you can build from there to saying, uh, saying, wow, mothers and fathers, they're not, they're not opposite. So the fact that, well, Jesus called God Father 987 times. I don't know how many. That's an argument against mother. Why is it an argument against mother? Okay, I'm off that. But I saw some, <laughs> I saw the curious looks go across your face when I tried to pass that one by without saying anything. I think I'm getting to know you better after one. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but the father when. Jesus saves us, saves us. We think of salvation as more than fire insurance. That was our topic 10 years ago. More than fire insurance. And you guys started at Bill Carl's church. Um, salvation includes um, also Jesus, Jesus' teachings. And it includes something that Lutherans are better at than Presbyterians. And less privileged people are better at than more privileged people who are often Presbyterians. And that is, uh, that is what we call in, in uh, atonement theory, Christus victor, the idea that Christ is victorious over um, the principalities and powers. That's another model for thinking about how it is that Jesus saves us. Uh, it's, it's in a mighty fortress is our God, which even Presbyterians sent the Sunday after 9-11. In a lot of Presbyterian churches, I remember I was at Flower Mound Presbyterian Church outside of Dallas preaching. And I looked at it, it's a sea of red, white, and blue, the Sunday after 9-11. And we sang, a mighty fortress is our God. And all the Presbyterians <coughs> said, although this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God is will God's truth to triumph through us. Oh, oh, ask who that might be, Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he, will win the battle. So Calvin works with that model. He says, Christ saves us by defeating these principalities and powers that would bog us down. I don't know. I, 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 you know, reading the paper, what's going on in Syria, I've mentioned this too many times today already, but it, it's evil. I mean, this, this thing is evil. There might be a place for even we uh, Presbyterians to, to, to really reclaim uh, Christ's power over uh, principalities and powers. Now we need another two hours to tell what would we mean by that. <laughs> you know, but I mean, oh, you know? Um, that's the way Christ saved us, by teaching us and by not holding anything back. Yes, by dying on the cross. By dying. How's our time? No, you don't have much. <laughs> <laughs> we barely